Saturday Night Live comic is out. Saturday Night Live Shake Up. A dramatic reversal of fortune for a comic. Shane Gillis out at SNL. Just four days after he was introduced as a new cast member. Amid a firestorm of criticism. In a war for comedy, I think the ones with jokes will win. Shane Gillis noticed that when he tells crowds his father is a Fox News guy, they often boo. Growing up in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, watching Fox News isn't out of the norm, which is why at first he was surprised when audiences booed his father. Gillis didn't take it personally. He saw opportunity and made it part of his act. He's a Fox News guy. <laughs> Don't, yeah, it's fine. Also, I see you guys. Most of you have Fox News dads. How dare you deny your fathers? Gillis released his first special live in Austin in 2021. On stage, he conveys a cocky yet friendly demeanor. A guy you would like to get a beer with who is quick to let you know that he is just joking. Or maybe, unsettlingly, that he isn't. I had to go to my niece's 7th uh, and 8th grade girls volleyball match recently. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, dude. Shut up. Just relax. I don't want to kids. But if you ever want to get out of something, that's all you have to do. Like if your friend, like, do you want to come to our son's t-ball game? Be like, what grade are the kids in? <laughs> and then no matter what they say, go, oh. <laughs> Live in Austin was not streamed by Netflix, HBO, or any other network. However, Gillis funded it himself and released it for free on YouTube, where at the time of this video, it has over 10 million views, receiving little to no attention from the mainstream media, but earning big praise among comedians and fans. Did you like it? I really liked it. Really? You're very funny, dude. Thank you very much. I man. mean, I, re I wanted to hate it. Wow. I, I swear to God, I just watched it. I watched it on my vacation in the woods. I, your stupid face came up, and it was really, this guy's one of the hot new guys. You're even a hot he, guy. Even though he looks like he's 48. <laughs> I'll see you, man. Uh, that means a lot. Uh, that was Bobby Kelly, and uh, pretty sure he hated me, so that's nice. For most comedians, their first special is a coming out party. But Live in Austin wasn't just a coming out party, but a reintroduction. A chance for Gillis to make a fresh impression on people who had not thought of him since 2019 when he was thrust onto the main stage and was perhaps the most talked about comedian in the world. It all started September 12th when Saturday Night Live announced it was hiring three new cast members, including Gillis, who at the time was a little-known stand-up and host of an obscure podcast. In the hours after the announcement, an independent journalist named Seth Simmons unearthed a clip from the previous year where he and co-host Matt McCusker bantered about Philadelphia's Chinatown. I wonder how that started. They just built one up looking building and people were like all right no one said anything Let let's the fucking live there huh? it's obvious gillis was imitating what sounded like a disdainful bureaucrat from an earlier time poking fun at the type of person who would say that but nonetheless he said it and it soon became the one thing the majority knew about him on the morning of september 13th gillis was at the center of every major news story the timing of it all couldn't have come at a worse time as one of his fellow hires was Bowen Yang, who is widely known as the show's first Asian-American cast member. Compared to Yang, Gillis seemed like a throwback to a time when his brand of comedy was praised. Oh, hello! With me today are Yuki Kosamoto from the Tokyo Times. Hey! Ichi Tayoka, Director of Public Affairs for the Atari Corporation. Hey! And Tatsuro Watanaki, Japan's Minister of Finance. Hi, hi. Gillis issued a grudging semi-apology, calling himself, quote, a comedian who pushes boundaries, adding, I'm happy to apologize to anyone who's actually offended by anything I said. In retrospect, it was probably inevitable that the invitation to join the show would be rescinded. More remarks were discovered, including Gillis' description of Judd Apatow as, quote, than ISIS. Lorne Michaels, the executive producer of SNL, said that he is a fan of Gillis, but the network was concerned about backlash. On September 16th, four days after Gillis was announced as the newest cast member on SNL, Lorne Michaels released a statement saying he will not be joining the cast and the comments he made on his podcast were offensive, hurtful, and unacceptable. A different sort of person in Gillis' situation might have argued against it, casting himself as a defender of freedom or artistic expression. It worked for Dave Chappelle. He addressed his critics in a Netflix special, which was less a stand-up routine and more a lecture. I said what I said, and boy, I heard what you said. My God, how could I not? Gillis, however, declined to plead his case. We'll bring up cancel culture. I'm just like, dang. and I don't want to be on the other side of it, where it's like, I'm a free speech guy, I'm a... 
It's like, dude, I don't want to be involved in any of this. I right. just want to do comedy. Like countless comedians before him, Gillis understands the importance of saying something socially inappropriate. Decades ago, common profanity served this purpose, but audiences today barely register George Carlin's seven dirty words. While his firing from Saturday Night Live seemed like a death sentence, it also endeared him to a cohort of politically conservative-minded fans, some of whom probably second-guessed their feelings when hearing his joke about their favorite president. People think that Gillis being fired from SNL was the reason his career took off, but he was grinding it out the old-fashioned way for almost a decade. As Gillis has grown, so has his demographic. What was once a rather homogenous audience is now a bit more diverse in that there are now a few stone-faced women who seem to have been dragged to the club by their podcast-loving boyfriends. Comedy podcasts have been a huge part of Gillis's career, and after the fallout of the 2019 fiasco, he used them to share his side of the story and ultimately bolster his following. In the not-too-distant past, comedians who faced a similar plight as Gillis would have went on late-night talk shows, like Norm, when he was fired from SNL. I'm firing you there from the show, and then I, I said, uh, oh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, why is that now? And he goes, uh, oh, you're not, uh, you know, you're not funny. Yeah. And then I said, uh, I said, holy lord, that's even worse news, you know? <laughs> put it in sports terms why you got fired with OJ too much. That's exactly why you were fired. In those days, you would only get 8 to 10 minutes of airtime max, and the style compared to the untethered banter of today's podcasting platform is contemptuous at best. Podcasting is the counterculture to mainstream media. It's supposed to be, but the numbers suggest that the counter may in fact be bigger than the culture. When Gillis went on the Joe Rogan Experience for the first time, it reportedly reached over 11 million listeners. That's twice the typical audience of Saturday Night Live. Matt and Shane's secret podcast has hundreds of thousands of listeners on a weekly basis, many of whom pay one, five, or ten dollars a month for bonus content. It seems like Gillis hasn't met a comedian who didn't like him. In the summer of 2021, he was part of Burt Kreischer's comedy tour, playing mainly arenas and minor league baseball stadiums, while also appearing on Kreischer's podcast, Burt Cast. What do you tell me to think? Uh, okay. Rock me, mama, like a wagon reel. Rock me, mama, any way you feel. Hey, mama, rock me. Rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock me, mama, like a southbound train. Hey, mama, rock me. What do you think? Gay. <laughs> <laughs> When you are on a podcast, unlike on stage, things are unscripted and only funny at times. And podcasting is just a way for him, like other comedians, to supplement their real passion as a stand-up comedian. But now more than ever, it's unclear what people want from their stand-up comedians. As popular as comedy has become, it's equally divisive. Dave Chappelle may be the most well-known stand-up comic there is today, but his routines about the trans community sparked outrage. Boy, I heard what you said. While still, he earns millions of dollars from his deals with Netflix. How could I not? While at the same time, a performance he had scheduled in Minneapolis was moved at the last moment, the venue stating, hosting Chappelle would be incompatible with creating the safest possible environment. Norm MacDonald was friends with Gillis through their friendship, Gillis was able to share this quote. In a war for comedy, I think the ones with jokes will win. Oh, it's just like, yo, yeah. that's fire. Norm MacDonald is king. This quote is very important when it comes to understanding why comedians like Norm, Chappelle, and Gillis are the culture, even when the mainstream tells us they are the counter. Late night hosts and their shows are imploding because they claim to be comedy, yet Colbert and Kimmel are known less for being funny and more for pushing political ideologies. After the 2016 election, SNL began its broadcast with this laughless rendition. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gay. <laughs> <laughs> the show even tried to depict 46 sympathetically as an aging normie, a sane, logical man in a mad world. The message more aligns with the view that we are living in a tragic era, not a comedic one. Today's comedians seem to think that clapter and approval is comedy, but Gillis understands that true comedy often derives from saying things that are inappropriate. Gay. While a comedian's political beliefs should not be taken into account when judging their merit, Gillis often tells his audiences that he never voted for 45. I took skull out of my mouth to come up here. <laughs> and I didn't vote for Donald Trump. Makes me like the Nelson Mandela of central Pennsylvania. <laughs> Gillis gets a big laugh with his Trump impersonation. It's uncannily good, and the one thing that is neither an endorsement 
or an indictment. Oh, you want me to do Trump? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Trump impression. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it Trump? What's the problem with this park? Why do you want it so bad, Donald? We've got a lot of Jews down there. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. The impersonation didn't derive on stage, however. He crafted it during the pandemic as he and fellow comedian and friend John McKeever used their own funds to develop 12 sketches and uploaded them to YouTube for free. One of the most popular is Trump speed dating. I would never suck a guy. But if I did, it'd be one of the best sucks he's ever had. The show is called Gillian Keeves, and season one was such a success, they dropped a second season, which was surprisingly just as funny or better than the first. It seems like a big portion of fans are drawn to Gillis because he reminds them of someone from their hometown, someone that doesn't resemble a celebrity. He considers himself o flight and can make fun of himself better than anyone. His whole campaign was at me. <laughs> I was watching TV, he was like, fat idiot? I was like, yeah, dude. Yeah, what are we doing? What the fuck are we doing, dude? We're building walls? Hell yeah! If you played high school football, you undoubtedly had someone on your team that resembled Gillis and his mannerisms. Growing up in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, Gillis was known as a big guy who could crush beer, and he has worked hard during his career to maintain that reputation. Appearing on a drinking gang podcast hosted by Barstool Sports, he carried his team to victory by drinking over 15 beers in an hour's time. What most fans remember about this podcast is the moment when a little-known producer tried to go viral, threatening to wrestle Gillis if he made a joke about ordering Chinese food. What do you think? Gay. What fans failed to see is the devastating hangover that weighed over him the following day. Instead of staying home and nursing the hangover, he did seven sets, saying, quote, I did seven sets. I needed to kill seven times to feel better. Like most kids, Gillis knew about comedy long before he knew about comedy clubs. While his father came from the generation of George Carlin, he was drawn to high-energy comics like Carlos Mencia and Dane Cook. Most of all, like many of us in our mid-30s, he remembers watching Will Ferrell in Old School, thinking he could do that. We're good, streaky! Yeah! While he felt like he could be an actor, Gillis didn't know where to start. But unlike many of us who thought we could be Frank the Tank, he took the steps necessary to make that dream a reality, building an impressive resume along the way. That I played, uh, it's D1 football, and then if you join West Point, if you join the Army during uh, active war, you are te technically I'm a decorated veteran. That's a medal. That's sick. I quit right away. I quit West Point right away, first month, <laughs> and uh, then you know I got SNL. So technically, I'm a Division One football player that is a decorated veteran and was cast on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't do one of those things. <laughs> In Philadelphia, Gillis had befriended Matt McCusker, a fellow comic, and they spent enough time trying to make each other laugh that they figured they might as well set up some microphones and start a podcast. They are a complimentary pair. Where Gillis likes beer and sports, McCusker is a devoted cannabis endorser with a fondness for dubious schemes and theories. What do you think about Rogan getting compromised? Rogan got compromised? Joe Rogan, I think he's compromised, dude. Have you listened to the Joe, do you listen to Joe Rogan podcast? Uh, occasionally, depending on the guest. I used to listen to it all the time. Like, I started listening to it in 2010. And as of late, like, he, like, you know, he had that show, like, uh, Joe Rogan Questions Everything. It was like a show about, like, Kells. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bigfoot. <laughs> I th I have a theory that it's he launched that on the cable network and someone came up to him and was like, bro, you have a big platform, knock off this conspiracy. The appeal of this kind of podcast is that listeners, if they have the patience to sit through hours of idle banter, get a chance to hear something uncensored and unfiltered. I think there was one rumor about you where people were dumping on you through hammocks. Yeah. Is that true? A sexual thing? A sexual thing? Yeah, where people were taking on you. A sexual thing, right? Yeah, sexual yeah. sexual dumps, not like just like you know, not like sanitation. Gross dumps. What, what the? F this is <laughs> this it's a rumor. I just want to ask. Well, no, I'm, I'm saying. I, I think it's who cool. cares? Awesome. Business is it if anybody's? If it's True. a sexual thing, good God, do I? Did I ask you about your sexual life? Yes, I mean, almost you immediately. Have you ever? You. Have you ever? Literally licked, immediately. Have you ever licked an? Yeah. I mean, yes. have you? It's another human being. Yeah. And yes. how do you feel about that? You I'm know? pretty excited and, and, about it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. None of your this is what I do in bed. Nah, I, I, I promise you. Chair, I promise you, if we were to divulge me and my present and past <laughs> wives, girlfriends, and associates, the truth of our sexual relationship, it would make that sound so fucking kindergarten. That's yes. awesome, dude. That's right, awesome. You're stuff. talking about you've got dumped on from higher up in a hammock and had the mega oh, Jesus Christ almighty. <laughs> this kind of talk is certain to offend plenty of people. 
virtually none of whom are likely to be regular listeners of Matt and Shane's secret podcast. Such is the allure of shocking content. It can turn those who enjoy it into insiders, united against those outsiders who don't. In this sense, Gillis and countless other provocative comics and podcasters are descendants of the so-called shock jocks, radio personalities who inspired loyalty precisely because of their determination to violate taboos. Younger listeners who know Howard Stern as a thoughtful celebrity interviewer are sometimes startled to hear old recordings of him bantering with Klansmen or asking women profoundly inappropriate sexual questions. Opie and Anthony began broadcasting in 1995 and cultivated a more accommodating sensibility and a closer relationship with stand-up. Anthony Camillo was fired from the show in 2014 for provocations that were more angry than funny. After he had an altercation with a woman in Times Square, Camilla posted a picture of the woman along with the words, Animal Pig Face Worthless Meat Sack. He subsequently launched his own streaming network, Compound Media, which was the home of A Fair One, a podcast that Gillis used to co-host. One of the things that Gillis learned in 2019 is that comics should expect to be judged by whatever they say on podcasts. Stern sometimes tried to coax women guests to sit on an ottoman-sized vibrator he had in the studio. Rogan recently spent two and a half hours talking to a theoretical physicist. The regulatory environment has changed as well. Stern's show was repeatedly fined by the Federal Communications Commission, his heirs worrying less about government action than about the complicated mixture of approval and outrage they inspire among members of the general public, and among the corporations that often determine the limits of acceptable speech. Gillis doesn't complain because he recognizes that part of what makes taboo humor fun is that it is, in fact, taboo, which means that comics who argue against linguistic taboos are usually being hypocritical, or at any rate, self-defeating. Gillis was not quite as surprised as the rest of the world when he was hired by Saturday Night Live in 2019. By then, he had signed with United Talent Agency and moved to New York, and that summer he performed at a high-profile showcase in both Montreal and San Francisco. Do you guys remember how, like, confident you guys were? (laughs) Going into that last one? Oh, you remember that? A little borderline arrogant going into that. All right, don't let it cost you again. No, I relax, relax. I did not vote for him. In 2019, Variety reported that Lauren Michaels had brought in Gillis as part of an effort to appeal to more conservative viewers. Michaels denies this, but he agrees that Gillis does provide a different point of view. At first, SNL told him he had passed a background check. For five or six hours, he could enjoy the idea that he had joined the most venerable institution in American comedy. And so that lasted for about like three hours before an article came out that was like, here's what this guy says. There's a clip of me saying some, you know, unsavory stuff. Yeah. But talking shit. It was, it was the one podcast we ever filmed. That's the one they used. Wow. And it just happened. To, and it was funny, too, because people were like, man, they really had to dig to find this. I was like, yeah, it's probably like three minutes in. <laughs> it was like, we had one podcast online. Bowen Yang did not comment publicly, but plenty of other performers did. The actor Daniel Day Kim from Lost and Hawaii Five-O wrote, It took 45 years for SNL to get an East Asian cast member, and in that same year he'll be joined by someone who would have no problem calling him a f- Another actor, Samu Lu, wrote, This word has been used to dehumanize my people for over 150 years. You don't get to use it in the name of edgy comedy. Gillis' first public statement about being a comedian who pushes boundaries sounded ridiculous to many people, including Gillis, who has since apologized for saying something so pretentious. The argument over his firing was not about free speech. It was about what sort of performers Saturday Night Live should hire. A few of the show's veterans spoke up on his behalf, on principle, including Norm MacDonald who live by the creed that comedians should be troublemakers. And Rob Schneider, who wrote that we are living in an era of cultural unforgiveness and suggested that Gillis was being unfairly punished for comedic misfires. Schneider, who joined SNL in 1990, is sometimes described as the show's first cast member of Asian descent. His maternal grandmother was Filipina. There was no public outpouring from people insisting that the show should keep a cast member who had uttered a racial slur. I went into Lauren's, Lauren Michaels' office and he was talking, and I was convinced I was getting fired. Like, I knew I was getting fired. Because if they didn't get me on that, there's so much more. <laughs> so much worse. <laughs> and I was like, whatever, I'll do... If I just... If I get fired here, whatever, I'll just go do Joe Rogan next week, and I'll be fine. 
Gillis remembers those days as a surreal blur of frantic meetings and phone calls and texts. UTA dropped him as a client, while clubs like The Stand kept booking him. If anything, the episode made him more devoted to comedy, because he wanted to prove that he was really funny. It was during this period of time that a friend put him in touch with Louis C.K., whose tenure as one of the country's most widely admired comics ended suddenly in 2017, after five women accused him of sexual misconduct. C.K. discovered, as Gillis has, that he could keep doing stand-up despite the public's disapproval. In 2021, CK won a Grammy. The award suggested that there is a considerable gap between what show business professionals say in public and how they vote in private. Gillis and CK are now close, once collaborating on a marathon podcast in which they attempted to discuss all 45 American presidents. It lasted nearly six and a half hours. Among some of his peers, Gillis is now viewed as an expert on what can and can't be said. Theo Von Teodoro hosts one of the most popular comedy podcasts on YouTube. And when Gillis paid a visit last year... Even that seems like a white guy in like a wig, kind of. Yeah. This, to be honest, this is you, you are getting borderline. This type of thing is a little dangerous. It is? Speculating on black guy's race. Oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> no, look, as, as a, I'll, I'll tell you yeah. where the line is. Okay. We're getting close. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> one lesson from Gillis' experience might seem simple enough. Don't use racial slurs. In one of Gillian Keeve's most recent sketches, it consists of almost nothing but Italian-American stereotypes. The underlying joke is that, in the current political environment, you can say whatever you want about Italian-Americans. Gillis is, in some sense, a purist. He cares more about stand-up than about anything else. That means he would rather be funny than correct. It also means he recognizes that there is more to stand-up than just making people laugh. Gillis' heroes are performers like CK and Chris Rock, who are widely celebrated not just for their punchlines, but for their insight. It is probably thanks to these performers that so many people now take comedy seriously, more seriously sometimes than comedians might prefer. In a Saturday Night Live sketch from last season, which was cut from the broadcast but posted on YouTube, the cast members seemed to be mocking people like Gillis. John Mulaney, the host, played a man who had just lost his job for having made inappropriate comments. Introducing the new Fisher Price podcast set for white guys. Now you can shout every crazy thought in your head without ruining your life. It doesn't record anything at all. The promise of comedy is that a truly great joke, a truly great performer, is undeniable. In the industry, comics pay close attention to who can make a crowd laugh so hard that people are gasping for air, and who can reliably fill venues around the country. Gillis is already known as the first type of comic, and he seems to be in the process of becoming the second. Give me that old-time religion!